thanks for joining us, Glenn. As always, these big events, these big shows, great to have Absolutely. Deloitte here and yourself. Great to be here, Joe. Yeah, this is you know always the highlight of the year, right, for MedTech. True. And you know what's different this year is I went through, I don't know if you noticed this, I went through the roster this year, and there were an over-indexing of bankers, finance, family offices. Mm -hmm. So the investment community is paying attention to a policy-driven sort of event. Are you seeing any changes in the market right now from your perspective? From, from, a, from an, investment, an investment, uh, investment perspective? Yeah. Well, it, it, it's, you know, it's tempering a little bit on the, um, particularly in some of the hot areas or diagnostics, I think got a real kick during the pandemic and you saw a lot of money going into diagnostics and that's starting to temper, which is understandable. Um, and so I, all that said, I, I continue to be really bullish about that space. Um, it's just a little bit of a whipsaw effect that we're seeing in the marketplace. The, the diagnostics industry, if we would have talked about that 10 or 15 years ago, I might have yawned <laughs> candidly as a headhunter, <laughs> yeah. right? It wasn't the cool pressing the envelope play. Well, what has changed about diagnostics now, other than the obvious elephant in the room, what we just went through? Yeah. But has technology changed? Has longer term thinking? It's a combination of, of sensors, just the incredible progression in um, you know, Moore's Law, mm -hmm. as applies to uh, piezoelectric sensors, all kinds of different sensor technology. I mean, the, the expense for a sensor today is you know, a hundredth of what it was. I, I don't even know the right ratio, but, but I mean, the, the rapid uh, uh, innovation in the sensor space and the cost of those sensors is, is a game changer now. So you're seeing uh, sensors being applied in all kinds of different technology that's fundamentally shaking up uh, diagnostics. Maybe not shaking up today, but it's on the verge of shaking up. Um, and, and you couple that with a trend towards decentralization that's going on in healthcare anyway. You know, retailers getting into healthcare, a push towards hospital at home, and just a push towards virtual care in general. And you've got kind of the perfect, you know, recipe for a, a real charge behind that diagnostics industry right now. We're very different kind of diagnostics that we would have talked about 20 years ago, right? Right. Very different kind. Right. My client back then was Abbott and their benchtop chemistry analyzers on throughput and robotics there. Yeah. So, you know, that was it. But I, that makes sense. So you've got hospital at home, you've got onboard sensors now, you've got empowered consumers now. Right. Uh, who are who want to be predictive about their health on well before it becomes a sort of an epic treatment of a therapy, a disease state. Yep, yep. And that that is the real it, part that gets me excited about where the industry is heading. What you know, we think about the future of health and where things are going in the next 20 years. Um, we believe that the industry will start tilting towards more early detection and prevention, wellness, uh, away from the sick care model that, that there is today. But the whole power behind that trend is diagnostics. And, and so what that means is maintaining wellness, observing and maintaining wellness, early detection of, of issues when they pop up so you can intervene when it's not an expensive or a, an acute uh, condition, um, and then frankly, better treatment decisions, better uh, better understanding of exactly what's there and matching it to the right uh, treatment, whether it's a drug or a procedure, um, and then the the ability to monitor, you know, both during the procedure and after the procedure too. So, you know, diagnostics is going to play a, a transformational role across that whole patient journey, but push it much more towards the front end. Mm. Um, and we're seeing that start to take place. And that makes a lot of sense. So you've got this 23andMe that's obviously hit the market over the last decade. So now I can see what you're pre-wired for. Yeah. And now I can start to monitor yeah. what genetically you have a predisposition potentially to slide down that range. And if I can put sensors on board, that are almost disposable, yep. that's a really interesting market. But question I have, and I don't know, because I know Deloitte just came out with this report, um, 
haven't had a chance to dig in too deep. Who's going to pay for that? That's the question. I'd say there are two kind of barriers to progress. That's one. And then the second is some of the cultural uh, and, and call it clinical process um, evolution and adoption, right? You know, so, so on one hand, the culture and the process aspect of it is that the, the health system is wired to do things in a certain way today. People's jobs and roles are dependent on it. And, um, and clinical protocols are set up in most cases to reflect the world we have today. So it's, you know, healthcare doesn't like to change those protocols quickly um, because anytime you introduce change, you introduce risk and potentially jeopardize outcomes. So that's one big barrier. Uh, but to your point, the other one is reimbursement. Again, the system is not wired uh, to pay for it today in that regard. And, and frankly, if I were to do the actuarial analysis, what, what we would probably see is an increase of cost in the short term, but then in the medium term, you'd have a decrease in cost because you're catching things earlier and you're able to, to stem disease you know, and, and not have it be so expensive. But paying for that bump up in the, in the near term, mm -hmm. that's hard, right? Most, most governments don't have the extra funds to be able to pay for that. So it's gotta be a really clear case for why I would pay for that diagnostic to offset costs in the near term. Mm. So I think the last number I checked was about 19.5% of our GDP is on healthcare. And I think 80% of that 19, 19.5% is the management of chronic disease, Okay. right? So you've got heart disease, you've got di diabetes, you've got mental health. Uh, and so does the diagnostics address those chronic diseases or are we going to have a, di and, and that workflow, to your point, those patients have been in the system for a long time. Yes, yes and, and, you know, yes and more. So again, I think diagnostics, a lot of diagnostic focus today has a clear value prop proposition around chronic disease because patients are already, already diagnosed. We're already spending a lot of money on them. So how do you kind of keep them in zone better, right? So there's a huge opportunity on that. In fact, the panel I'm doing tomorrow will talk about, um, you know, chronic disease management with wearables and uh, I think that's exactly the value prop. The key is gonna be getting in front of the chronic disease and catching it when it's earlier stage, when it hasn't, almost every chronic disease has comorbidities associated with it, right? So it's catching it early enough so you catch it before some of these other comorbidities start popping up um, so that you can um, lower the overall cost of care over, uh, over the trajectory of the patient's life. That's yeah. the key. Yeah, and I, I love that as an entry point, that the diagnostic, because we already have a baseline on that chronic disease patient. And to your point, it always slides into more, uh, more robust, if that's the right word, comorbidity panel, that that's when you start to have the heavy load on the healthcare system. Right, right. So that could be a really interesting spot for diagnostics to aim to make a case, because to your point, you try and change workflow from a regular blood draw but going down to LabCorp and putting that entire system at risk, now that gets yeah. back into the population of, okay, so what happens to those individuals? Right, right. Right, where do they go? Right. And that's a scary model in the system. Yeah, it is. But, you know, your, your point about changing the, the process, I mean, you brought, you brought up earlier the consumer angle, I think, um, and, and the one thing that is forcing change in the workflow is the consumer. The consumer draw on the pool to be able to take control, to have more convenience, to have things be more uh, efficient, more timely. Those are huge draws. And frankly, a lot of the clinicians are looking for those same factors too. COVID opened a lot of people's eyes to that because in some ways we've conducted healthcare in a more efficient way during that process by necessity. So now it's a matter of how can we take the learnings from that and um, institutionalize them and expand off of them into other areas of, of healthcare beyond COVID, right? Mm -hmm. 
and, and that's, uh, that's really the opportunity here, but the consumer power, now that the consumer understands what can happen, they're going to want more. And I think we'll see that continual pull from the consumer uh, to, to, to really push businesses to adapt and innovate in that regard. I don't know if you want to chat about this. We'll, we'll, we'll catch the conversation now if you can chat about this. One of the things that I'm excited about is the empowerment of the consumer yeah. because of technology. Having said that, that generally finds its way first into the tier one hospitals and the upper earning e echelon, but a lot of times leaves behind yeah. the underrepresented, the rural communities, and the tier two, tier three type hospitals and healthcare settings. Yeah. Yeah. Has the industry given enough thought to that? It's, uh, it's a great point, and I have talked about technology for years as being a great democratizer that you know, as technology drives some of these diagnostics and therapeutics to be simpler, cheaper, easier to use, it should lead to more access to care, right? Should. Um, but all that said, we can't leave it up to a should. There has to be an explicit focus. So the good news is that the industry, I'd say as a whole, is pretty focused on creating equitable access and uh, making sure that products are designed for equity right from the start. Um, you know, I think we're seeing that as a theme here at the conference. Um, and, and every company that I work with has that as an explicit part of their agenda. Whether it's a government mandated part of reporting or not, they, just like, you know, most companies' mission and philosophy about healthcare is to ex you know, improve life, improve health, they're now extending that to include for everyone, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and I think that that's a great change in the way that we're focusing on healthcare. And I'm, I'm hoping the industry executives and the people who make policy and procedure really pay attention to that because it's really easy to have that bifurcation in the road of, well, I don't have 4G or 5G in my house. Right. My community doesn't have that. The local doc clinician, healthcare provider, he or she is really at a, and still in 1970s because of these rural areas and even inner city at times. Um, yeah. So I'd be curious to watch that closely and make sure that organizations like TMG, Deloitte, right, yeah. Avamed, make sure that the populace is, is serviced there. One of my colleagues just issued a, a short article on the future of rural health, which really focused on exactly that question of how do you get, how do you create access for people who in many cases don't? And I don't think it's an easy answer, Joe, but ultimately the good news is that we are seeing focus and once you get focus, you'll get results. Yeah. Right. There, there is a heavy dialogue around that right now, I see yeah. that. Yeah. So we're coming to the end of 2022, 2023 coming up. We've chatted about diagnostics. We're both bullish on that. Right. What else are you going to be watching in 2023? Well, software is a medical device uh, in general, too. So, you know, we're projecting this, the report we just published in Europe, we're projecting a 22% growth rate in software as a medical device over the next five years, um, which starting from a small set, but nonetheless, that's a fast growing area. So I think that's going to be interesting. All that said, there's a lot around digital infrastructure that again, we'll hear about in my panel tomorrow and other parts of the conference that really needs to be established for information to be exchanged, that interoperability of data, um, that I'm really going to be keeping my eye open about how we're progressing on that agenda. Because once you get that digital highway going and the language that speaks you know, the same uh, same terms to everybody, it, it opens up a whole world of possibilities around healthcare that, that we can't do today because of the fragmentation. I'm excited about digital. I'm also, uh, we're talking about the language, is the only way you can scale communication is to have an agreed upon language that hasn't occurred yet purely in a digital domain, so right. that's it. Right. True. And then the alignment of interests. Um, I don't know if the healthcare community right now the, the rewards and alignment of rewards 
for where we want to go. I'm watching that and concerned around that. And uh, our digital infrastructure, uh, there's a lot of work to be done there. There is. Um, a lot of opportunity, uh, and I'm waiting for them to lead the way. And then finally, telehealth. I know that you've been following telehealth, Deloitte's been following telehealth for a long time. What's your outlook on it? COVID was a catalyst for growth, and now we're sitting back going, okay, but are we, are we still gonna keep telehealth at the front of the line as a product and a service? The, the general philosophy that came up in the last couple of years is that the new way of triaging patients is moving from just immediately a, a physical appointment to digital, virtual, physical. So digital meaning kind of an app, an algorithm, could be a website, but, but some kind of algorithm based, to virtual meaning a Zoom type of call, uh, to physical. And, and I think that, you know, we're going to see that continue as a, as a mindset around how we're going to make care more efficient for the consumer and for the, for the clinicians at the same time, too. Um, with that, we're also seeing a lot of innovation around the types of devices that could be used in the home or in other, like a retail setting that could make virtual health even more powerful, um, that I think we're just at the beginning of a revolution there that, uh, you know, again, a lot of it's going to have to do with how easy to use it, um, how cheap and how accessible it is, right? Um, and how much infrastructure does it need, 5G and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, one of the things, for instance, for diagnostics, I think, is today, if we think we have COVID, we have a hypothesis that we have COVID and we get a COVID test to, to confirm that hypothesis. But where testing, home testing needs to go is I don't feel good. And so I spit in a tube or I prick my finger or whatever it might be and, and whatever the machine is, the machine tells me what I have. I don't have to guess, right? And, and so I think we have a long ways to go in terms of making some of the enablement of virtual care a little easier. But all that said, we're, we're on a great trajectory in that regard, Agreed. exciting trajectory. Agreed. Well, I appreciate your time. Um, always love chatting with you and getting your thoughts at that top level, because you get to see a lot that most of us don't get to see. And Deloitte is just a bank of information and experts. I always appreciate our relationship with you. Well, I, I appreciate the chance to talk. As always, thanks all again. All right, Joe, friend. good to see you.